Okay, look, um, my own view is that the US-China competition in strategic terms is primarily focused on the Indo-Pacific. Um, and that China's military strengths are primarily directed towards East Asia and the Western Pacific, and particularly the US position in this region. As Admiral Blair wrote in his own testimony to the commission, uh, the key, given what China perceives as um, its priority of reunification, territorial integrity objective, are impeded by US relationships in the region. And as, as the Admiral wrote, the key China's relation leadership believes is undermining and overmatching American military capability in the region. In order to do so, not only must China build its own strength, but it must in some ways wedge and wean allies and partners that the US has uh, in order to achieve its objectives of reunification and completion of what it considers to be its territorial uh, uh, objectives. Now, the bottom line is, uh, East Asia thus is the only region where both the US and China have identified their respective core interests and where I believe or assess that failure and success by either side could lead to a game changing situation, not only for the US or China, but also, also for the region and for the globe. So how effective has China been in this effort to wedge and wean uh, allies and partners? China, as you all know, we don't need to get into it in great detail. I saw the list and many of you are, are deeply into this stuff, um, uses a combination of coercion and inducements. And it's my judgment that overall, China has been ineffective in wedging and weaning away US allies and partners. China has made some inroads on trade and diplomacy, significant ones, I think, particularly with smaller countries along its periphery. Uh, many of you will say Cambodia. And I think some of the smaller island states in the Pacific region and in the Indian Ocean. And we can talk about that, but these are, I think, some marginal uh, victories of wedging and weaning uh, by China uh, in this theater. In general, however, I think US ally alliances have overall improved in the last two decades. And I know that's somewhat controversial, but uh, I would say that in terms of interoperability, rotational and other forms of basing and access, high-end exercises, integrated defense production and military purchases, there are many metrics in which we can measure that over the last two, three, uh, two, uh, two decades and a half or so, uh, that we have advanced our alliances, advanced our partnerships, created new partnerships. And I'm well aware that headlines really don't capture the full strengths of these deeply institutionalized alliance mechanisms, habits and networks of cooperation resulting from decades of hundreds of annual exchanges and engagements between allied militaries and their American counterparts. And I would also highlight amongst increasingly each other. So things like the Australia, US, Japan connection, the India, Australia, Japan connection. There are new formulations of interactions and in intra-Asian webs, sometimes they're called, that are thickest amongst our partners and allies. And that is generally for a net benefit or net gain in my judgment for the United States. I would also note that China's behavior, assertiveness, illegal claims, expansive claims, are largely reinforcing the progress on alliances and creating new partnerships where I think we would have had even tougher sailing. None of this is easy, of course, alliance management or building new partnerships, but China's assertiveness, expansiveness, uh, at times uh, heavy handedness his, is in fact uh, creating new opportunities for the United States where it might've been a little bit difficult. Just look at the US-Singapore strategic partnership uh, which has been enhanced twice in five years with longer term uh, uh, extensions, new training in Guam for the uh, Singaporean Air Force. We've also opened up new avenues of cooperation with countries like India, uh, with uh, New Zealand, uh, and uh, of course with Vietnam. So I think that uh, this also offers us a, a significant positive uh, trajectory. And meanwhile, we continue longstanding relationships with other countries, Philippines, Thailand, um, uh, even uh, fairly quiet, but, uh, but productive, uh, significant cooperation with Malaysia and Indonesia. 
And outside the region, where countries in Europe, for example, I'll just use here the case of the United Kingdom and France, um, which have territorial and other interests in the Indo-Pacific region, have also increase their leverage. Now we'll have to see after Brexit how far UK is willing to go, how far much its resources allow, but I do think that UK and France's uh, own respective step ups in the region are, are, are a positive um, element of the uh, US posture in the region. I would also note that US allies and partners remain largely receptive, open-minded, and quite uh, productively engaged with a series of US-backed initiatives whether that be the Maritime Security Initiative, which many of you know has been extended to South Asia and to the Pacific Islands, uh, the Quad consultations. Recently, there was, as you know, uh, exercises amongst the, uh, the Quad countries and exchanges. Um, and our partners in the region, whether that be Japan, Australia, uh, and others, are themselves increasing security and other capacity building cooperation in Southeast Asia, the Pacific Island, and amongst Indian Ocean states. And it's not always security. I just want to emphasize not always just military or hard hardware or, 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 or kinetic issues. For example, take a look at the Mekong cooperation. Korea has stepped up. Australia has been long active and very productively engaged on water issues and other elements. Japan has been a significant uh, uh, contributor to a Mekong uh, development issues. So both in the uh, what might be called non-traditional and the traditional areas, our partners themselves are helping with the burden sharing of a very resurgent and a rising China. Now, I do want to emphasize in kind of giving a, a relatively uh, upbeat picture of our alliance and partner relationships, that our alliances and partnerships are not problem free or open-ended. And I just want to suggest that they never have been. Not in the last 50, 60 years, has there ever been a problem-free relationship with an ally? No dis differences on major issues, whether they be kinetic or diplomatic or UN voting or trade or other. The current situation is not fundamentally different. I would argue that there are changes in the power balance. We can talk about that. Uh, more competitive rules and norm-based systems that we can talk about. But none of our alliances and partnerships are problem-free or open-ended. And the Chinese assertiveness, uh, even in the face of Chinese assertiveness, these alliances and partnership will have limits and they'll have limits both in US-China crises and they'll have limits in US steady state competition. And this is particularly evident on issues of economic statecraft, which I'd be happy to get into. So what is required on the part of the United States, what we need to do is careful, persistent alliance and partner management. And we need to particularly uh, uh, build up our optimize our commercial and diplomatic relations to match our quite robust defense cooperation with regional partners. Many of you will have seen Secretary of Defense Esper's a statement yesterday in which he highlighted some of the things that from his perspective DOD is doing to enhance what he calls line of effort number two, which is alliance and partner building. So what I would say is that if we have a challenge on alliances and partnerships, uh, yes, it's maintaining robust defense cooperation, reassurance, deterrence, dissuasion, but we must also work more on the commercial and diplomatic side. China's challenges, in my mind, are much tougher. China's challenge is, uh, is that it is alienating U.S. allies and partners while trying to woo them with trade and investment and infrastructure. And my general assessment on this is that America has ample ability to improve commerce and diplomacy when we put our mind to it, when we put our resources to it, when we put our policy to it. But China has very little room under Xi, uh, Xi Jinping's very uh, authoritarian and very unbending leadership to back away from what I consider to be expansive, illegal, threatening uh, territorial and reunification claims. So are there scenarios in which our alliances can rupture? The day doesn't go by where I read somewhere in some opinion piece or another that this alliance is breaking, that alliance is gonna rupture, we're at the edge of the precipice of this. Yes, I mean, one has to analytically assume scenarios under which alliances and strategic partnerships could be ruptured or broken. But my own view is those conditions would be so profound and so profoundly different from today 
that the meaning of alliances and partnership under those scenarios would be completely different from what we think about today. What are some of the scenarios? I sketched out three in my testimony. One is a reset of the major flashpoints in the region through negotiation or war, either way, either through peace or through war, one could look at an environment whether you didn't have those flashpoints. And so alliances may or may not make sense. I think it could change or a scenario could develop where China's ambition or capacity to achieve its core interests is abandoned. Um, after all, we didn't predict coronavirus four months ago. Um, one can imagine black swan events under which China no longer has the capacity or the will to make such uh, claims. You could also imagine a scenario when the US says enough is enough. We got to take care of our domestic environment. There's not a public support, congressional support, bureaucratic support for being as engaged or as fully engaged in the region. I think these are very unlikely under current conditions, but they are scenarios under which we could talk about a ruptured relationship. Let me turn a little bit to the commercial issue, which as I've kind of hinted at is one of my biggest concerns these days. China's economic growth and emergence as a platform for global supply chains has made it absolutely a crucial partner for the US, its allies and partners. Now, I'm not gonna get into for the moment whether this is a result of China cheating, gaming the system, et cetera. Those are real questions, they're significant. But the commission asked me to assess where we are on issues of commerce with our allies and partners in the context of the US-China competition. And I think here we have four uncertainties that I would flag that are really significant, really meaningful for the way in which the understructure of Asia's remarkable economic growth is gonna take place. The first uncertainty is how and how much the US and China decouple their economies. You all know the basic lines of this discussion. There's been talk about delisting Chinese companies. There's been talk about moving away from financial integration, technological decoupling, trade decoupling, tariffs, et cetera. We shall see how much decoupling. I would just mention to you that a new Peterson Institute for International Economic Study on financial integration between the United States and China suggests that such financial decoupling is not taking place, is not occurring. And uh, we will have to wait some time because we're in the middle of COVID where all kinds of implications for supply chains, trade routes, et cetera, has taken place, whether true supply chain decoupling. We've all heard the rumors of 2 billion funding by Japan to move out of China. We've heard about security and resilience of supply chains. We've heard a lot about companies being funded to move out of China. Let's see, let's see over time whether this is possible given that China is beginning to climb back from its COVID uh, uh, implications and restart its economy. So the first is how much the US and China decouple. Very closely tied to that is how much regional countries decouple. Because in parallel with American efforts to uh, uh, calibrate its economic and trade and security and technological relationship with China, countries in the region are doing the same. So you have a spate of new laws, regulations, uh, bureaucratic structures in the region, new restrictions on Chinese uh, students uh, and, and looking at potential uh, security threats from uh, particular relationships with China. So we'll have to see how much the region can afford. The preliminary data, if you look, for example, at ASEAN over the last three months, and I, I, I direct you to a study by the Nikkei Weekly in Japan, it appears the Chinese investment is in fact moving to Vietnam and increasing the level of integration with Southeast Asia. So again, uh, we'll have to wait for a lag in this very difficult time and see how that moves, but there is um, clearly some uh, implications of, 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 of that in the region. A third uncertainty is much broader. Um, I, I've simplified this, but, but my basic thinking is this. Part of the last 30 years of globalization and supply chain has come from Asia, own policy reforms, docking on to a globalized international system in which you now have global supply chains, global markets, and global relationships. But in some sense, underneath that globalization, there is a trans-Pacific economic integration and an intra-Asia integration. And as you will note, 
at least in two respects formally, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership and the Comprehensive Progressive Trans-Pacific Partnership, the successor to the Trans-Pacific Partnership that the United States decided to leave, is focused on intra-Asian integration. That is, the US is not party to those agreements. Now, on the one hand, RCEP is not so important. On the other hand, CPTPP is a kind of successor, as I said, to TPP, but it is very important. If both of those go forward cumulatively and the US is out of both of them, then the prospects for continued integration and very little decoupling with China combined with such arrangements could favor or privilege intra-Asian integration over trans-Pacific integration. That I believe would be prejudicial to our interests. A fourth quite recent potential worry, something to watch for, I don't think it's anytime coming anytime soon, is signals that China might wanna join the CPTP. Now remember, when TPP was first proposed, some Chinese reformers were looking at joining and docking onto that eventually in a way to push domestic reforms, a kind of external pressure to reform China's economy to world standards, gain from those benefits as they have from joining the international system. But I would say that again, if intra-Asian integration proceeds at a faster pace than trans-Pacific integration, then the US could be negatively affected. And so let me just end on that sector and we can come back to those discussions. Now, it's not to say the US doesn't have some advantage on commerce. And I wanna spell those out because all is not bleak. First, the US is vital to allies and partners for remittances. Nearly 50% of remittances to Vietnam, for example, come from the United States. Over 25% go to other countries in mainland Southeast Asia. The US remains key to private capital market access uh, around the world. Uh, people will look to US capital markets, US commercial banks, borrowing, US government securities. Um, it's, US is critical for high-end technology research. And finally, of course, the use of the dollar. We forget that, to, that the use of the dollar uh, keeps this system uh, lubricated, as it were, and that many people will uh, a privilege and continue to use the dollar. But we shouldn't take these, um, these conditions as a given, as uh, they could be eroded if we don't carefully watch, adjust our policies and, and, and take some actions. Also, China's own record is not unblemished. China is not a, um, uh, a, uh, a clear player in all directions of commerce. Sure, it presents a great market, Yes, there are many opportunities for production there, but it is increasingly used economic coercion and restrictions of various kinds to uh, push political agendas, uh, reward uh, elite friends uh, and allies, punish those who would uh, oppose China. Um, there have been questions about Chinese labor, uh, inadequate uh, infrastructure oversight, uh, environmental impacts. So there are plenty of things. And recently COVID, uh, which first hit China, has also brought into high focus in much of Asia, the heavy reliance on China for tourism, for consumers, et cetera. So that's kind of uh, the picture. What has developed recently that is worth watching also is how the region is responding to Chinese economic statecraft. And that means uh, taking distressed companies during this time of COVID uh, and buying them up and uh, gaining um, entree into key sensitive sectors, for example. There has been a concern about IPR theft. There's been concern, as I mentioned, about Chinese students' access to high technology labs at, at sensitive institutions and facilities at universities. Um, there's obviously the big raging debate about 5G, which the UK just spoke out about recently. So there are concerns about China also that continue to be calibrated and monitored by the region. I will just show my hand. My estimate is that there will be some supply chain diversification, some supply chain diffusion, but it will be far less than people who want there to be decoupling is gonna happen. I think Asia is going to very narrowly define how they 
uh, restrict China and the Chinese market. They will do so where they think that they're a competitive edge or where their security is imperiled, but they will largely seek to gain benefits from productive positive elements of commercial relations uh, with China. So that's kind of how I think uh, that will proceed. Finally, I wanna talk a little bit about effectus, uh, effectiveness of China uh, and US competition on norms, values, narratives, sometimes they're called. And here too, I think China's non-democratic one party authoritarian political system has almost uh, zero resonance amongst regional elites and publics. Uh, even amongst non-democracies or illiberal countries in the region, a whole bunch of countervailing factors such as nationalism, religion, history, ethnic considerations, uh, and specific disputes with Beijing, South China Sea, East China Sea, whatever, um, uh, constrain overly close relations with China. China does not have an open door. Um, this isn't the Asian values debate of the early 1990s. In fact, a regional poll of elites by the Institute of Southeast Asian Studies in Singapore, uh, I think um, mistakenly identified China as the most influential regional economic and political strategic player, but that's the right to have that view that it is the most influential. But what was really eye-catching in that is the countries closest to China on its borders were most acutely concerned about China, such as Vietnam, and also that 71.9% and 85.4% respectively viewed that majority Chinese influence as dangerous and unwelcome. So it's quite true as many, many polling uh, data suggest that the US has slipped in its rankings, that there is less, uh, uh, if you will, favor favorable views of the United States that must not be uh, glossed over or, or dismissed. But I would say that the overwhelming uh, level of support for the United States remains quite high. And the concern about China's growing power is, uh, is increasing, not decreasing. So that leads you to a very interesting thing. U.S. popularity has slipped in part because U.S. power is not being exercised appropriately or fully according to some in the region, while China's growing power over, perhaps over exaggerated, is being viewed negatively. So we can, again, uh, discuss that. And I would just note that American criticisms about human rights and democracy are constant part of our managing our alliance and partner relationships. They have been for decades. It's nothing new. Um, and they do irritate and grate on the region. But this really contrasts quite starkly with China's demands for uh, control, obeisance, and hierarchy. And I would say that most countries in the region would, would choose to be, if you will, uh, uh, face American pressures on human rights and democracy rather than China's uh, requirements that they, that they uh, follow Beijing's line on key issues or that their territory historically belongs to China or that they have sovereignty claims. So th this is a kind of a, a, a tug of war. And I would also note that generally US criticisms on values issues do very little to inhibit defense cooperation with the United States whereas China's human rights standards, which are allegedly in alignment with much of Asia, I don't believe they are. I think many publics in Asia do not want to be aligned with China's view of human rights standards, uh, foster next to nil security and defense trust. So that's where we are on the, uh, on the, on the issue of norms and, and order. On the narratives, uh, one thing China has been very active on, and I continue to talk about narratives because I think it's important how China sells its role in the region. They talk about the nine dash line, they talk about the new security concept, they talk about the community of common destiny, they uh, talk about the code of conduct. Um, but all of these things generally accentuate anxieties in China. They don't uh, mitigate them, they don't reduce them. Um, Take, for example, when um, the Chinese foreign minister had a chance to comment on ASEAN's Indo-Pacific outlook. He did not. It strikes me as quite telling that every country from India through ASEAN, through Australia, through Japan, have articulated an Indo-Pacific outlook. And yet Ch China, of course, has not and has rejected it. Um, but the region seems to want to, even if they define it somewhat differently from our Indo-Pacific outlook, want to be in 
uh, some sort of alignment or convergence with the American narrative about what constitutes order, rules, norms in the institute in the region. So I think that's a kind of a telling sign to me of where the regional countries are positioning themselves. And then finally, I'll end this section with simply saying, the US is also has some advantages in the following four ways, three ways. First, the US doesn't harbor any historical grudges from past conflicts. It's made up uh, into an alliance relationship with Japan. It has a remarkable, we're celebrating this month, the 25th anniversary of US Vietnam normalization. We have uh, new relationships with India. Uh, people don't maybe remember uh, when US India relations were really quite terrible, but have improved significantly. Second, the US is not an irredentist state. We have not a single territorial or sovereignty claim in the region. And that's a huge burden that we don't have to carry or have to deal with with regional partners and allies. Um, and we're not also seeking to turn um, um, overturn outcomes that have been left over by history. Uh, the outcome of the civil war in, in China, the, um, the end state of, of World War II that has left uh, disputed territory. We're not trying to overdo our outcome. We're trying to assist allies and partners, trying to create stability, et cetera. And I would finally say that for all the material grains that China has brought to the region, and they have, not only to the region, but to themselves, this is a great thing to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. It's a fantastic achievement on many levels. But it's also led to very negative complications for China, where before negative narratives about China didn't exist. Take, for instance, the recent Sino-Indian border conflict, where Indian narratives now about China have begun to uh, seep into the larger body politic, which was focused much more to its west on Pakistan, but today is now uh, much more uh, focused on uh, the potential threat from China. So Karen, I'm at 5, 10, 15, 20 minutes. I've got about a couple of things to say uh, on, the, um, on the evolving approach and then I'll end and then we can turn it over to Q&A. So you. the final points I'll make are the following. First, history's hangovers are pretty deep in the region. They're not going away. My worry is that the US uh, uh, is currently perceived by many countries in the region, unfortunately, I think incorrectly, but unfortunately is somewhat distracted uh, on the less charitable uh, uh, spectrum, even dysfunctional, highly polarized. Um, I think that um, there are a couple of features always to remember about Asia Pacific responses to the US-China competition. First, it's largely like in the United States gonna be based on domestic drivers. And these domestic drivers are very, very complicated. Uh, and particularly because the US and China refract through different constituencies in each of these countries, it's going to have very complicated ways of adjudicating how you manage the US-China competition. The second is that the region and its countries have much more agency, many more tools, uh, and much more experience than we give them credit for, for managing great power tensions. Many of these countries managed to be on both sides of World War II. Many of these countries managed the US-Soviet conflict quite ably for their, from what they considered to be their own national interests. Many of these countries have tools we don't think of, like the Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam has both the Vietnamese Communist Party that can deal with Beijing, but also a government of Vietnam. In other words, there are toolkits there are mechanisms, there are experiences, there are histories which lead me to assess that these countries can manage uh, between US-China competition. And I made this statement in the, uh, in the testimony that it's not that Indo-Pacific countries, it's quite true that they don't wanna make choices. What they want even less is no choices. They want multiple choices. And that's why you see ASEAN bringing in Japan and Australia and India and Korea and other countries to be engaged with them. And they also have the ability to join strategic alignments amongst themselves, giant, join groupings such as the Quad and strengthen their own national militaries, such as Australia has recently announced, largely in partnership with the US. So basically my last sentence of this whole paper is that if I were to tell you what I think is happening, 
is that most Indo-Pacific countries are working very hard to stay on the right, constructive, productive side of the United States. And they're merely trying to avoid being on the wrong side of China. And that's what I see going ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Satu. Very good. Um, we do have questions. I greatly appreciate you got a lot of information in there in a really relatively short period of time. Um, so we will go immediately to the questions and I might have a couple of my own at the end, but we will keep our guests. And first I'm going to um, read the question from Denny Roy, who is one of our staff members and uh, senior fellows here at the East West Center. Beijing and one is, of my hard, most difficult interlocutors, okay. Yeah, I know. Tough questioners, I should say. That's right. And you moderated his session a couple of weeks ago. So right. um, Beijing is currently overreaching, overassertive to China's own strategic detriment. As you note, this creates opportunities US can take advantage of. But it also creates the danger of US, of the United States getting in the way of China further damaging its own position. What principles should guide US policy in striking this balance? Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Denny. As, as you know from our previous conversations and, and parts of the testimony I didn't read, as I say in my last sentence of the testimony, above all, US policy, the way to balance what you quite rightly say, uh, and I totally agree with your premise that China has overreached and uh, overasserted, et cetera, is that our policy should not be only about and at China, but it should be about principles that are applicable to all, all. And that means principles in the rule of law in the international system. And I would take the case of the South China Sea UNCLOS statement of, of, the, of the State Department and Assistant Secretary Stilwell's comments recently as a case in point. We did not, we called out Chinese assertive behavior. We called out the variance of that behavior with the uh, PCA ruling on legality issues on the claims issues. We highlighted some of the behavior of uh, Chinese state-owned companies, et cetera. But it wasn't based only on a pushback of China. It was based on principles, the rule of law, institutional judgments, such as the PCA ruling. And I think we've seen a largely favorable, if quiet and measured response in the region. And I do believe that should guide us in the region. If we're just going around saying it's only about and at China and all we wanna do is make sure China doesn't rise and we're gonna make sure we make it tough for China, that is not going to gain us friends and allies and partners. It's going to inevitably make the US-China relationship uh, unable to be managed well and we do need to manage this relationship. I would note Mr. Esper has announced, it's a matter of public record that he intends to go to China before the end of the year. I think continuing dialogue, discussions, even with significant disagreements, is quite important to manage the US-China relationship, just as we manage our alliance and partner relationships based on rules, norms, values, and institutions. Thank you. The next question is from Terence Matsuo. Dr. LeMay, how do you evaluate US-China cooperation on shared security interests such as North Korea? Could you also compare and contrast President Trump's policies with Vice President Biden, particularly if um, he wins the upcoming election? And I would assume that means if Vice President Biden wins, so. Well, uh, Terrence, thank you for the questions. Uh, you know, I could write a dissertation probably on that. You don't want me to do that. Um, uh, Look, I'm not going to try to speak. I don't speak for anyone. I'm an academic uh, who works at the East West Center, as, as, as everyone well knows. Um, I'm an analyst, so I try to analyze. I give my assessment where it is. Um, I think um, both campaigns have statements about where they think their policy is going to go. I think you can tell by some of the recognized experts on both sides, as well as the current officials, uh, what they're saying. Um, uh, at least on the China issue, there seems to be more consensus than divergence about, uh, about uh, how to deal with China right now. Uh, so I, I really don't wanna, you know, obviously pretend that I speak for anyone, hardly the government and hardly uh, the vice presidential challenger. 
I will say that uh, managing, uh, as I said in the question to Denny, uh, one of the reasons why I think US-China managed relationships relations are so important is because we do want to be able to manage uh, disputes uh, such as the ones on the Korean Peninsula. Um, there may be occasions when we have to talk to Beijing very constructively about what is possible there and what is not possible. Uh, people have even suggested, as you well know, that there ought to be some contingency planning, discussions on contingency plan. I know that's very controversial. I know that's very maybe far down the road or or at levels which uh, I'm certainly not aware of. But, but I would say that as with all of the disputes, whether it's cross straits, Korean Peninsula, East China Sea, South China Sea, a uh, not an agreeable dialogue, but some management of communications and dialogue with China is gonna be critical in order to keep the region uh, peaceful and stable. And I fear that we are at a juncture where sometimes opportunities such as on health, on uh, joint research on health care and health responses, um, uh, you know, we may be missing opportunities where common interests could dictate uh, some, uh, some cooperation. Good. Thank you, Satu. The next one is from Anu Anwar. I believe Anu is at Harvard. He says, uh, despite the US and its allies lead efforts to challenge China's assertiveness, China doubled down its resurgences in the Indo-Pacific region, such as border clashes with India, South, the Ch South China Sea issue, and wolf warrior diplomacy, et cetera. So is there any substantial policy option that would effectively constrain China's assertiveness in the future? Well, as I said, uh, I mean, I think China is, uh, if you will, pardon the expression, sort of self-harming. Uh, this kind of uh, expansive assertiveness, uh, threatening uh, countries in the region uh, is to China's disadvantage. I think it does China no good. Um, I think you've seen the statements from regional countries about its behavior in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, um, uh, what it's doing to Taiwan, uh, and the uh, increasing squeeze and pressure that it faces. I think you've seen the response in India. Um, uh, so, I mean, I, I don't wanna speak for China. I mean, it's taking these decisions for whatever domestic and, and policy reasons. As Denny said, I think it's creating great dilemmas for them. And as the regional polls suggest from ICs, um, many people are looking at the rise of China and saying, this is not what we want. This is a matter of grave concern to us. So what the US should do under such circumstances is, I would, sorry to say, repeat what I said to Denny, fundamentally work with allies and partners, look for ways in we can continue to do things together and manage our relationships in ways that are productive. Try to, not to make all of these issues only at, at and about China, meaning, just take an example, uh, restricting security issues and technology where it's necessary to do so, but not closing out or creating avenues where there's no opportunity to trade in technology. So are these separable? I believe they are. Um, uh, creating regulations on Chinese investment in sensitive areas, but not restrictions that are so broad that would restrict Chinese investment in areas that could be productive for the United States, that could lead to good employment for the United States and its citizens. So I think we have to think about fine tuning the restrictions and fine tuning the pushback rather than an across the board antagonistic pushback. Thank you. A uh, question from Ethan Allen. Um, how do you view the implications of China's rapidly growing scientific and technological capabilities in terms of stabilizing or destabilizing relationships with the United States and other nations? Uh, this is an area, Mr. Allen, uh, I've not done uh, any granular work on. I have been looking very closely at uh, Chinese dispatch of students abroad to sensitive areas and sensitive programs, uh, sometimes referred to as PRC, China's economic statecraft. Um, you can see that there has been concern expressed in the United States uh, in the, during the Cold War days. If you remember, we had restrictions on certain countries 
regarding particularly sensitive areas of research. That could be nuclear, missile, uh, areas of ballistic and miniaturization of technology because of the nature of our relationships with those countries. So as China moves up the uh, scientific and technical uh, uh, chain, there will of course be concerns. And what I find particularly interesting is those concerns are now being, being expressed in high technology countries in the region. So you see, for example, that Australia had a, quite an interesting report put out in Australia about, um, it was a very uh, colorful title, something about taking honey and, 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 and creating flowers, or basically it was looking at <clears throat> how um, PLA associated folks <clears throat> had been entering into certain areas of sensitive research uh, perhaps engaging in activities that they shouldn't have been. You know as, as for a fact that we've had such restrictions in the United States. Japan recently announced such restrictions. I'm aware that South Korea recently did a study of its universities and how to control export controls. I know so, certain bureaucracies in the US are, are heavily engaged in watching how these technology exchanges occur in the educational sector. So I think that as, as China uh, moves up the scientific and technological base, it will alter, and we've seen this in 5G um, and, and all the controversy that's been created around it. And I don't think this is gonna go away. I don't think this is gonna stop, but we're going to have to, again, as I said, on trade or investment or other areas, calibrate where these sensitive areas are and where they should be restricted and protected for national security reasons and where it inhibits free flow of trade investment, and if you will, the good stuff that could go on in commercial relations. Okay, we have a question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, recently, China behavior in, East China sea, in the East China Sea is quite worrisome. Given the United States strong presence, military presence in Okinawa and in Japan and ROK in general, how do you see this? Will the US military presence affect China behavior or not at all? Well, I, it seems to me perhaps the questioner's answer may be in the question, the US is present. It has not prevented China from making challenges in the East China Sea. It has not prevented it from sailing its ships. It has not prevented its uh, maritime militia. It has not prevented its air force. It has not prevented activities that uh, uh, other countries in the region who also have claims would, would, would see as threatening or imperiling. So on its own, the presence has not detracted or put a stop to those activities. Um, I'm also mindful that in the East China Sea, uh, as I understand the situation, um, Japan is quite able uh, to manage its uh, administrative control of, of the islands and the area. Uh, the US, uh, as you well know, has, uh, has uh, stated that Article 5 does apply to the area and that we would be uh, uh, an ally of Japan if the need arose. But um, I, I, I continue to believe that China, largely driven by reasons of authoritarian uh, leadership, uh, by the need for the CCP's legitimization, um, by an attempt to fulfill certain national core objectives, mainly the reunification of Taiwan, but also the rejuvenation brought about by uh, finishing its unfinished business on uh, territorial claims is not going to go away. And as China's power and capabilities increase, they will continue to press uh, forward on those fronts. Thank you. We have one from uh, James Corcoran. Um, how does the China-Hong Kong present situation fit into your views as expressed here today? Well, I guess it, uh, that's uh, really, uh, important question. Um, I, I guess it would fit in with my line as follows. One, China's behavior on Hong Kong, which seems to suggest all of those kind of stock phrases that people use about China's behavior. Uh, under Deng Xiaoping, they were going to bide their time and hide their strength, but now they've decided to move up the ladder, move quicker, show their strength, impose outcomes, um, uh, it suggests to me that whether or not that's true, 
and my own view on reading uh, people such as um, Richard Bush at Brookings or Ryan Haas at Brookings leads me to believe that the Hong Kong situation is far more complicated with a number of variables coming together that led China to act in the ways that it did. And I urge you, commend to you Ryan Haas's or Richard Bush's writings on this. Um, my own sense is that what the net effect of whatever caused China to behave that way whatever the exact precise weight of the variables was, it has frightened the region. It has created um, animosity in the region. You saw that UK suspended extradition uh, treaty with, uh, with Hong Kong. You've seen the Australian reaction. You've seen other countries' reactions. So again, uh, to go back to the first questioner, Dr. Danny Roy, China is acting in ways that in sort of stay in line with what my own assessment is, that it's pushing and reinforcing US's alliances and partnerships in the region because of the worry about how China might behave as it gets stronger. Thank you. We have a very long question from Russell Hanma. I'm going to uh, boil it down. He lists a number of different grievances uh, uh, international pr property rights, viol uh, intellectual property rights violations, dealing trade uh, secrets, et cetera, et cetera. The, the question is, uh, do you think the United States of America will sue China for damages? Uh, I, I, please forgive me. I'm not sure I fully understood. It. The United States government would sue China for which damages, sorry? I, for damages, uh, it, for instance, uh, currency with China and the Chinese consulate in Houston being closed down because of Chinese stealing American trade secrets, using the consulate as a cover, uh, uh, et yes. cetera, just property. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm just not in a position to know or be qualified to know whether the US government is in a position, has loca standi, as the jurisprudential word would say, loca standi to sue China in court because of activities that are allegedly going on at the Houston Council. I just don't know. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, from another uh, anonymous attendee, how is the United States dealing with this situation in regards to Northwestern Pacific Island states since uh, China is increasing their investments in that area? That must be Micronesia and Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, I, I would say that the U.S. Uh, and its partners and allies, again, I would refer to Australia's uh, step up, uh, New Zealand's reset. I hope I get that right. Sometimes I confuse it and I don't mean to in any way offend our good colleagues, friends in Canberra and Wellington. Um, but, you know, the step up in Australia, the reset, uh, America's own active policy in the Pacific, uh, I would commend the Trump administration for inviting the Pacific Island to compact leaders to the White House. It's the first time ever that they've had an OFL office visit. You'll recall that one of the leaders, um, I can't remember now which of the compact states leaders flew back with Secretary Pompeo back to uh, the country. Um, I think that you'll see that uh, the compact negotiations, which must be done in 23, 24, 2023, 2024, rough time frame. Um, are, are, are getting more and more attention. That process has already begun. Uh, as you know, the Assistant Secretary of the Office of Interior and Insular Affairs has begun that process. Certain meetings have already been held and public statements have been made on them. I would also urge you to note that there is, for the first time in history, a Pacific Islands Caucus in the United States Congress, led by no other than Congressman uh, uh, Case, uh, Ed Case of Hawaii, uh, he has taken a leadership role in, in co-founding that caucus with um, uh, Florida Congressman Mr. Ted Yoho, who has had a very important role in the Development Finance Corporation. So um, there are many other members of that, Mr. Brad Sherman from California, Mr. Young from, um, uh, from Alaska, and there are other members as well. I believe Mr. Ami Berra, who's now chair of the subcommittee on the Asia Pacific House side. So, uh, you know, we're clearly, um, uh, aligning uh, with our allies and partners on the Pacific Islands. We're clearly working directly with the Northwest Pacific Island compact states. We're engaging with the region as a whole. Uh, I have argued very strongly that this kind of traditional approach, I mean, historical approach, if you will, that somehow um, Australia will deal with Melanesia, New Zealand will deal with Polynesia, the US will deal with the northern part of the Pacific, you know, kind of this rough idea of uh, division of labor. 
is no longer relevant in this time frame, given the climate change impacts, given the economic needs, given COVID, given the strategic factors. I've argued for an indivisible Pacific policy that runs from our territories to our west on the Pacific, through the states of Hawaii and through territories such as Guam, all the way throughout the Pacific. And I think a policy that treats the region as a whole and as an intricate part of our Indo-Pacific is, is really important. And again, it's a matter of public record. I'm relaying to you this morning, I was had the opportunity to hear Mr. Yoho and, and um, uh, Mr. Case uh, give a briefing on their plans. And they are working to issue new legislation in the Congress about focusing on the Pacific Islands. So you can see that lots of things are being done at the executive level, State Department level, at the congressional level, and with our allies and partners. So uh, I do think that the, the uh, net balance of, uh, of our engagement along these vectors uh, is really important because China has in fact made, but I wanna repeat again, I wanna repeat again, it is my view that our engagement with the Pacific cannot be just because China is there. I mean, that's just not a sufficient, we have a history in the Pacific, particularly in the Northern Pacific. Uh, we have allies and partners such as Japan who are working in the region, other countries. Um, we have trade issues. We have, um, some of you will know that compact states have migrant rights to the United States. And uh, there's a very interesting new G general accounting office study on these compact migrant rights. And in fact, we uh, at the East West Center in Washington just hosted the team at the general accounting office's new report on the compact migrants. And so they live in the United States. These are citizens who are uh, in the United States. They have right to live, educate, work here. So this is uh, people to people, this is strategic, this is economic, this is humanitarian, this is global environmental issues such as climate change. So on all these vectors, uh, we, can, uh, we can engage. Thank you, Satu. The question from Michael Smith, it's a little bit different. Uh, Iran's foreign minister recently said his government is negotiating with China for a 25 year strategic partnership involving a reported $400 billion in Chinese investment. I think this, the question is, in your opinion, is this a legitimate partnership or just a joint effort to keep America off balance? <laughs> well, first of all, I, I, I haven't been following. I have seen uh, Phil Saunders uh, and Joel Whitnow have a new piece on the Iran-China connection. Mm -hmm. um, which I have not read, I want to be very clear. Uh, so there has, this, there has been this analytical uh, narrative floating around that China and Iran are being driven. Um, but I must tell you, this is sort of one of those things like the China-North Korea relationship. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't think it's a, 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 a necessarily a positive one for the United States. Um, but if, if China's partners are countries such as Iran under sanctions and under um, uh, uh, difficulties themselves, it seems to me that that's, uh, that's something that China and Iran will have to figure out on their own. I, I don't know what the US can do about preventing uh, legal relations between two states. Thank you. And we're almost at the witching hour, oh, but I'm going to throw in one question okay. from Stuart Lai. And what are your thoughts on Congress's bills on the Uyghur issue and, uh, in Xinjiang and access to the Tibetan, to Tibet Autonomous Region? Uh, do you think the United States should foc or focusing on highlighting human rights issues in China is an effective strategy toward the PRC? Do you think it will change? Oops, I'm sorry. Do you think it will change the PRC's human rights policies practices considering that internal stability is a core issue for the CCP? I don't know what China will do. I think it's very important for the US to speak up on human rights issues. Good. It's critical for us to do so. It's important for us to speak on democracy issues. As I said, the United States cannot simply treat this as a strategic um, zero sum game. There are rules. There are norms, there are standards here. And I think the standards that the US abides by, by our elected representatives on human rights and democracy are critical. I just wanna say that if we're only doing tit for tat strategic play in the region without reference to rules, norms, values, and institutions, then we're just another player. 
And I don't think that is either, um, it's not possible from the supply side of the way we are constructed as a nation, as a country. But quite apart from that, I don't think that's the demand side from the region. As I have mentioned to you, the demand side from the region also asks us to be engaged on minority rights, on good governance, on uh, human capital development and human education. This is where some of our great work is being done. The YSEALI program, it inculcates standards of, of leadership and of, of, of self-actualization, but also real skills, technical skills. And in my testimony, one of the things I've proposed is a major program that, that the Congress can support on professional exchange between the United States and Asia. Real professional exchange, engineering, science, architecture, environmental uh, remediation, uh, where we share best practices. Because if I may just say, the US doesn't have all the answers. We have a lot of answers. We have a huge amount of capability, technology, resources. But we can also learn from things that are being adapted and used in Asia. I mean, Asia has become remarkably developed in many parts and a, a good professional interchange uh, is a way of, of not only building relationships for the remainder of this century, but a way of sharing best practices and, and outcomes that can be beneficial. So I really think we must speak out on issues of human rights and democracy. We must be engaged on those issues. People want us to be engaged on those issues, as I said, and I think it's important. Yeah, thank you so much. That's a I think such an important ending ending statement uh, for all of this. So on behalf of all of us, thank you so much uh, for joining us today, for giving us such an insight. And uh, we did put it up on our chat to, to look at your testimony. And I would say particularly look at your recommendations, which I hope will go forward on that. And so too, of course, we'll have you back again. Thank and Karen, I want to thank you. Really, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I want to thank you for all that you've done for uh, the external affairs and for inviting me. It was so nice to receive an invitation from my home office um, to, to speak to my all my colleagues and friends. And I learned so much from the questions and I want to also thank the participants. Really, thank you for taking your morning uh, on a Wednesday to, to join this session. And I hope it's been useful and I look forward to being able to see you uh, in real, real in real time in real space uh, before long. Thank you all.